today we're going to take a look at section 2.6, which is graphs of sines and cosine functions. And the first thing we're going to talk about is um, the unit circle representation that we had seen before on how um, sine was related to our unit circle. So if you'll remember, our unit circle looked something like this. And all the way around, we had ordered pairs that represented the coordinates. So over here, this was the coordinate 1, 0. This is the coordinate at the top, 0, 1. On the left was the coordinate negative 1, 0. And on the bottom, the coordinate 0, negative 1. And our sine function is the y-coordinate at every point. So the graph that we're actually going to take a look at today um, first is y equals sine of x. So the x value here is the angle measure. So the angle measures in radians of this that we're looking at over here uh, started out with zero radians, then it was pi halves radians, then we had pi radians, we had three pi halves, and we had two pi. And the sine value was the y coordinate. So we're looking at the y coordinate each of these values. The y coordinate at the angle 0 is the value 0. The y coordinate at the top of our unit circle is the value 1. Moving along over at pi, our y value is 0. At the bottom of our unit circle, we had a y value of negative 1. And back to uh, the original 0, 1, or 1, 0 location, 2 pi, we have a y coordinate of, one, of 0. And we would take then our axes and we will plot these points. So if you take a look, we need to go up and down to 1 and negative 1 because those are our largest values. And we need to go out to 2 pi. Half of 2 pi was pi. Halfway between that would be pi halves, which is the numbers we used before. Halfway between pi and 2 pi halves would be 3 pi over 2. And then what we're going to do is we're going to plot ordered pairs or point points at these locations. So the first point is 0, 0. That's the origin. Our second point is pi halves 1, so we're going up to 1. And then we have pi 0, so we're back down to the x-axis. And then we have down to negative 1 at 3 pi over 2, and back to 2 pi um, as the x-axis. And if we connect these in a nice, smooth way, we get that graph. And we would have the same graph if we had gone around the unit circle backwards, uh, which would in the essence be um, taking our values and using the same values um, on the negative side of the y-axis. So this is negative 2 pi and negative pi. We have negative 3 pi halves. Sorry, that's not very good. That's better. And then we have negative pi halves. And then we can plot our points just like we did before. Here, again, the pattern would repeat, so I would go down, back to the middle, up, and then back down, and I would connect these. So you can see the image is identical to the image we had just on the other side. Now there's a few properties that I want to mention about this graph, and uh, we'll go back and forth a little bit and sort of identify some of these. Um, the first issue is that the domain here is all real numbers. So you can either write that as the R with the double line on the left, or you could write that as negative infinity to infinity. Um, you can have any angle and take the sine value of it. Um, the second one, the range, the range actually keeps oscillating back and forth, up and down between the y values of negative one and positive one. This function, as we discovered earlier, but now we've discovered from a graphical point of view, is called an odd function. And um, odd function means that it has origin symmetry. That is to say that if we took our graph and we rotated it 180 degrees, sort of like spun it around like a spinner on a game board around the origin, it would land right back down on top of itself after it had gone around 180 degrees. This graph is periodic. <clears throat> And it is periodic with a period of 2 pi. It takes 2 pi before we end up getting, okay, let's try that again, before we end up getting the same image to repeat itself. 
and that's actually if you take a look back at our function why we have a full um, wave it looks like going all the way up all the way back down and back to, to neutral um, of the curve between negative 2 pi and 0 and between 0 and 2 pi. <clears throat> the next one we're going to look at is the x and y intercepts. So we actually get x intercepts on this graph at every pi value. So we can express that as n times pi and say that n is an integer. And one way to write an integer is to write uh, the integers are, are represented by the z with the double lines in the middle. The symbol that you see before that is a symbol that means is an element of. So this is saying that the n in this equation, this n pi, or this expression n pi, is actually an integer. So any integer, whole pi, negative and positive, whole pi values actually give me an x-intercept. The y-intercept is actually at the origin, so that's 0, 0. And there's only one of those, of course, otherwise it wouldn't be a function. The others are occurring, uh, interesting features to notice, are the maximum and minimum values. So let's talk about the maxes first. So the max values, if you take a look, they occur on the top here and the top here. And if you look at the y-values for that, um, it looks like they're occurring at, in, at pi over 2. And then I, if, if I continued going, I would get 5 pi over 2. And if I go backwards, I get 3 pi over 2. So we've kind of got this over 2 business going on, but it's not all of the over 2 values because, for instance, at 3 pi over 2 and at negative pi over 2, those are actually minimum values. So if we're going to write this down, it's kind of an awkward way to write this, but the first one, let's say, let's look at the one on the, um, on the positive side. The first maximum value actually occurs at pi over 2 on the positive side of the graph. So one way to write this <coughs> is to write that the maximums are going to occur at pi halves plus 2 in pi. So the first one's occurring at pi halves, and then if we add 2 pi to it, it occurs again. If we add 2 pi again, it occurs again, and so forth. And this is, again, for n that's an integer. And we can do the minimums in much the same way. It's just that they don't occur at pi halves. We can either write negative pi halves, or you could put 3 pi over 2. And again, they occur at every 2 n pi value for all integers n. Our next function we're going to look at is cosine. It has very, very similar features to what we just did. We're going to develop it in much the same way. We're going to draw our unit circle and remember all of our ordered pairs that we had before. So we've got 1, 0, we've got 0, 1, we have negative 1, 0, and 0, negative 1. We're going to do an xy axis, or an xy uh, t-bar, or chart, um, and they're occurring at 0, pi halves, pi, 3 pi halves, and 2 pi. And, of course, our equation this time is not sine, it's y equals cosine of x. And when we're taking a look at cosine of x, what you want to remember, of course, is that the cosine is the x-coordinate. So looking at these um, angle measures all the way around, we're writing the x-coordinate down. So the first x-coordinate at the angle 0 is the value of 1. And then at the angle pi halves, on my top of my circle, my x-coordinate is 0. On the left-hand side of the circle at pi, my coordinate of x is negative 1. Down at the bottom, I have an x-coordinate of 0. And then over on the right-hand side, I have an x-coordinate of 1. And I'm going to do the same thing as I did before. I'm going to graph this. And so here's my x-axis, my y-axis. Again, if you notice, the um, largest value is a 1, and the smallest value is a negative 1. And our graph needs to go on out to 2 pi. And we can cut it in half and in halves again so that we have pi halves, pi, and three pi halves. And then we can plot our ordered pairs. The first one is up here at a value of 1, and then I'm down to a value of 0, which is the x-axis. Value of negative 1 back up to 0, and then back up to positive 1. And if I connect these in a nice smooth way, they look something like that. Could have been better, but that's not too bad. And then if we create the same image on the left-hand side, um, we will you know, use the same values we did on the last one. In other words, we have negative 2 pi and, and negative 3 pi halves and <clears throat> negative pi and negative pi halves. And we plot those ordered pairs in the same pattern. We're back down to the x-axis, back down to minimum. We're back up to the x-axis and then back up to maximum. And if we connect these, 
we end up with the cosine curve for two periods. Just like we did with sine, we're going to look at some of the cosine properties, and there's five basic properties we're going to look at. The first is the domain. Just like the domain for sine, the domain for cosine is all real numbers, written as the R with a double line, or as negative infinity to infinity. My range is again negative 1 to 1, and we use brackets to say we can include those values, we can equal them, because we do in fact equal them at every maximum or minimum value. The third issue is the fact that this function is actually what we call even. We've talked about this in class before, this is an even function. Um, at the point when we talked about it, we talked about the fact you've seen even functions before, in particular something like y equal x squared is an even function. If you were to fold the graph along the y-axis in half, you'd have um, a mirror image on each side. Um, this is an even function, and again, it's sometimes called a y-axis symmetry. Um, the next issue we're going to look at is the fact that it is periodic, which we have mentioned before. Um, and it has period pi, 2 pi. And then the x-intercepts. All right, so our x-intercepts on this actually occur, if you take a look at negative 3 pi halves, negative pi halves, um, pi halves, 3 pi halves, they're occurring at all of our half pi values. And it's actually all of them this time, not just, you know, at some of them, like we had maxes and mins occurring out on the other ones. So we could say that this actually occurs at n pi over 2, where n is odd. We don't want n to be even, because if it were n were even, it would actually be evenly divisible by the 2 on bottom, and then we would have a whole pi value. We don't want a whole pi value, we want a half pi value. So those are x-intercepts. And then our y-intercept, of course, again, there's only one of them, as always. Um, and that actually is at 0, 1. It's at a peak, at peak value. Next, our maximum values. So if you take a look over here at the maximums, our maximums occur, of course, at y values of 1, but our concern is what the x values are at. So look, the x value of 0 here, and we have an x value of 2 pi and an x value of negative 2 pi. And if we did these again, and they keep repeating on this cyclic sort of pattern of 2 pi, since it's periodic, it's going to occur at all even pi values. So we could say n pi, where n is even. That is one way to handle that. And then the minimums, of course, are occurring at the same things, but where n is odd. So we can say n pi, where n is odd. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at um, how we can change graphs um, from the basic graph we're looking at. The first thing we're going to look at is amplitude. So if we had a graph with an equation of y equals a sine of x um, or y equals a cosine x, where a is not 0, and the reason a can't be 0 is because then we multiply 0 times sine or 0 times cosine, and then we wouldn't have a trig function. We just have a constant function equal to 0. This actually has a range of negative a to positive a, kind of like our negative 1 to positive 1 just a moment ago, and we call the absolute value of a the amplitude of the graph, or sometimes the amplitude of the equation. And the amplitude really is a positive number, that's why you see those absolute values. So no matter what the value is in front of sine or cosine, we just care about what the number is, not what its sine is. If its sine is negative, I'll show you what happens with that, but that doesn't affect the amplitude. Amplitude is actually a distance. You can either think of it as half of the distance between the maximum and minimum values, or you could think of it as the distance between what we've looked at so far would be the x-axis and the peak, or the x-axis and the minimum. There's one other common feature um, to look at right now, and that's called the period of the graph. Now, you've looked at this already a little bit, but um, let's take a look. Um, 
at changing that period. So if you have a B value that's greater than zero, and again, I'll tell you what we're going to do if we have it less than zero, but um, and you have an equation of y equals sine of bx or y equals cosine of bx, <clears throat> then the period, which in a standard, you know, without the b in there, would have been 2 pi, is actually found by taking 2 pi and dividing it by that b value. All right, so using those features, we're going to take a look at some guidelines for graphing. So the first one is that the graph, um, we can follow these steps. So the first thing is to find the period of 2 pi over b, and um, then you can actually lay out a distance of that value on each side, and I'll describe that. You can divide the interval into four equal segments, um, which um, is exactly how we did the 2 pi, and then I halved it, and I halved it again. We're going to evaluate the function at each x value obtained in step 2. The, facts, the values will be maximums, minimums, or x-intercepts. We're going to plot the points um, that we found, and we're going to consider that curve's amplitude which in reality is one of the first things I find anyway. We just don't use it until now. And then you draw the graph over additional periods if needed. So here's the first one we're going to do. We're going to do y equals 2 cosine x. And taking a look at this, um, we have this function with a period and amplitude, and that's kind of where I start. So I actually would start by writing down the amplitude. And of course, the amplitude here is 2. It's the number in front of cosine and it's a positive value always remember and then the period here is actually still 2 pi because there is no number inside with x so the period is 2 pi so we're going to graph this function whoops let's try that again we're going to take our axes and instead of having the peak at 1 and negative 1 we're going to go up to 2 and down to negative 2 and very little else in fact nothing else is going to change it's just the peaks and the valleys. So we're going to go out here to the right hand side and lay off our period, full 2 pi. And then we're going to half it. This is subdividing the interval. Well, half of 2 pi is pi. We're going to half those halves again and figure out what's halfway between 0 and pi, and that's pi halves. And then halfway between pi and 2 pi is 3 pi halves. And then we're going to plot these points. Well, what we actually know is this is a cosine curve, and cosine curves always start at a peak at their initial value. So that will be starting here at the value 2. We'll go down to the x-axis, down to a minimum, back to the x-axis and up to a maximum. And then our curve will look like this, just like it did a moment ago. And then we have to do this for a two-period interval, or over a two-cycle interval, sometimes what your book will call this. And this would go then now over to negative pi, cut it in half, negative, I'm sorry, negative 2 pi, cut it in half, negative pi. Cut each of those in half, and we have negative 3 pi halves and negative pi halves. And then we can plot the points um, that they represent. So again, we're back down to the x-axis. Oops, hang on just a second. All right, back down to the x-axis, down to a minimum, back up to the x-axis, and then up to a maximum. We'll connect those points with our nice smooth curve. And we have the graph of y equals 2 cosine x. All right, so I told you that I would let you know what happens when we have a negative, and here we've got one. We've got a negative in front of sine x. And um, again, it doesn't affect the amplitude, but it does, of course, affect the, the graph, what it, you know, what it will change what the graph looks like. So let's start out by writing down what our features are. So we've got an amplitude, of course, of 3, and our period here didn't change again. It's also still pi. Sorry, 2 pi. Get it written down the way I say it. <laughs> Now, in order to do this, we are going to start the same way. We're going to go up to a period, or up to an amplitude of 3, and down to an amplitude, uh, or down to a minimum value of negative 3. So here's 3, and here's negative 3. And we're going to lay out our period of 2 pi, and half that, and half them again, and label all of those every time. And of course on the negative side as well, 
take a look at sign. This is a sign graph, right? So on a sign graph, we actually start at the origin. So this, this is no different. We will start at the origin. But typically on a sign graph, as we move to the right-hand side to that pi over 2x value, we would go up to a maximum value. Well, the negative in front of my sine, in fact, in front of the 3 sine x, actually takes the graph and it flips it upside down. Or sometimes you'll hear it called a reflection. It is a reflection over the x-axis. So everything that was above is now below, and everything that was below is now above. So instead of going up to a value of 3, I start by going down to a value of negative 3. Back to the x-axis, and now I'm going to go up to a value of 3, where it normally would have been down at this point, and back down to a value of 2 pi. And my curve looks like the Klein curve, but flipped upside down. And of course, the image on the left-hand side has to, has to look exactly the same, so it has to follow the same pattern. So we're going to keep this pattern going, and we end up with this curve, like so. Alright, same directions, taking a look at another one, but this one actually um, has something else going on. So we had an amplitude, just like before. Um, what is my amplitude on this one? Well, it's 1, because there's not a number in front, right? Um, but the period is what's going to change here. I haven't done what the period change, so I need to show you what that looks like. We take 2 pi, and we divide it by the value in front of x, which is 1 third. Now, this is not 3. It is not 2 pi over 3. It is 2 pi over 1 third. And if you'll remember from basic um, you know, algebra and, and even earlier, division by 1 third is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal 3 over 1. So this actually gives me a period of 6 pi as opposed to 2 pi. And we're going to take our graph, and we're going to put our max and min on there at 1 and negative 1. We're going to mark out a period of 6 pi. We cut it in half to make it 3 pi. We cut it in half again to make it 3 pi over 2. And then we need to know what's halfway between 3 pi and 6 pi. Well, halfway between 3 and 6 and is going to be, the way you find those is finding a midpoint. You add the two numbers together, so 3 pi plus 6 pi, which would be 9 pi, and divide by 2. So this is 9 pi over 2. And on the left-hand side, of course, we'll have the same thing. So let me go ahead and label those two. This is negative 3 pi halves. Oh, I'm sorry. Get those in the right direction. Negative 6 pi over there first. There we go. Halfway is negative 3 pi. Half that again, I've got negative 3 pi halves. Halfway between the 3 pi and the 6 pi is the negative 9 pi halves. And of course, we plot our points. Now, cosine starts at a maximum, so this one will too. Maximum, back to the x-axis, down to a minimum. Back up to the x-axis, and then to a maximum. And then we're going to flip this over to the left-hand side. We'll follow the same pattern, down to the x X, um, axis down to a minimum, back to the x-axis and up to a maximum, and we can connect our line, our curve, by following the dots. Kind of like connect the dots from when you were little. All right, we have a couple more. Um, number four um, has both a period change and an amplitude change, so I want to see what that looks like. Again, we'll start with our amplitude. Our amplitude is 2. And then our period is found by taking 2 pi and dividing it by, well, in this case, 2 pi, because that's the number in front of x. So my period's actually 1 in this case, which is a little different. All right, so taking a look at my axes over here, I need to have a peak and a valley at 2 and negative 2. And then I need to have my x-axis cut into pieces, just like before. We'll go out full period and half those again. Now, it's going out a full period of 1. Half of that would be 1 half, of course, and then half of that's 1 fourth, and halfway between 1 half and 1 is actually 3 fourths. So you can think of that like quarters of a dollar. We've got 1 quarter, 2 quarters is 1 half, 3 quarters is 3 fourths, and 1 dollar itself. Then I have negative 1 fourth, negative uh, whoops, let's write that correctly, one-half, negative three-fourths, and negative one. And then this is a sine curve, and sine curves start at the origin. This one doesn't have a reflection, so it goes up, 
back to the x-axis, down, and back to the x-axis. And on the left-hand side, from the um, origin, we would go down, back to the x-axis, up, and then back to the x-axis, and we would connect our dots. All right, there's one other change that can happen to the graph within this section. We've got two more changes to talk about. This is the last one in this section, though. And this is a vertical shift. If you have the equation of y equals c plus your sine x, uh, this is a vertical shift. Sometimes it's called a um, vertical translation or transformation. It's a, it translates, it picks it, and it moves it exactly as it is. Of the graph, y equals sine x. And um, if c is greater than 0, this is a shift up. And if c is less than 0, this is a shift down. Okay, so it moves it up or it moves it down. So you can see on this one, um, I've got a negative 2 in the front, and it wouldn't matter whether the negative 2 said negative 2 plus cosine 4x or if it said cosine 4x minus 2. It, it doesn't make any difference. It's still a vertical shift. So we're going to identify the same features we did before. We've got the amplitude, um, which is going to be uh, 1, because that's the number in front of cosine. There is a number, but not, not the 2. That's negative 2. That's a vertical shift. We'll deal with him in a minute. But I'm talking about a number that would be located right here. And there, there isn't one, which means it's understood to be the number 1. Now, the period on this one would be 2 pi over 4, which, of course, simplifies to pi halves. So it's kind of a different period than we've seen before. And then we've got a, phase, or a, a vertical shift. And so um, I'm going to write this down just so that we make sure we catch that along the way. My vertical shift is actually going to go down, too. Now, um, when I'm graphing this one, I actually am going to start with a vertical shift. All right, so we've got our y-axis in here. And the first thing I want to do is I'll change the color of this so that I can have a new reference point. So this yellow is actually just going to represent um, that I've moved my graph down to. So um, that's not working. Let's try that again. So I've got this dotted line down here, and it's kind of representing my new my new x-axis, basically. It's, this, it's the x-axis shift that I'm making. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that as my reference point. Now, I still have the period issues. I've got um, negative, or I've got pi halves over here, and then half of that would be uh, pi fourths. Half of that would be pi eighths. And if we found halfway between pi fourths and pi halves, again, what you do is you take one fourth plus one half, you add them and divide by two, you actually get three pi over eight. And then we can do the same thing on the left-hand side. So we have negative pi halves. We have negative 3 pi eighths. We have negative pi over 4 and negative pi over 8. And now this is a cosine graph. A cosine graph starts with a maximum value. So we take our dotted yellow line and we go up 1 because our amplitude is 1. So if we go up 1, that's where we're going to start. And then we're going to go, and so I, I should label these. This is at negative 1, this is at negative 2, and this is at negative 3. Then I'm going to go down to the new dotted x-axis, down to a minimum, back up to the dotted axis, and then back to a maximum. And on the left-hand side, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go down to an x, the new dotted x-axis, down to a minimum, back up to the dotted axis, and then back to a maximum, and we're going to connect these dots. Sorry, it's not quite as smooth as I'd like for it to be, but you get the right idea in that one. And that's what you do when you do a vertical shift. So you deal with the vertical shift part first, and then you use the new translated axis, and you use your amplitude in relation to that, and your period in relation to that, and you get the same graph, but it's shifted down two units from what you would have gotten otherwise.